I want to acknowledge we are here in the territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh First Nations people. Before we proceed, I want to let people know who are watching on the live stream that we will be talking about residential schools today. I want to speak to any survivors and intergenerational survivors of residential schools who are watching. If what you're, we are talking about today is a trigger triggers difficult memories or causes distress, I really encourage you to reach out to the Residential School Crisis Line at 1-866-925-4412. I'll repeat that number at the end for anyone who missed it. On May 28th, to Kamloops, Swatmik announced evidence of at least 200 unmarked burial sites at the former Kamloops Indian Residential School. Other nations have announced similar findings since. This has been a difficult, heartbreaking, and traumatic time for Indigenous people across Turtle Island. We are witnessing a national reckoning with the true story of this country. My name is Lahaik Waskak, I am Niska, and I come from a very proud people. My grandparents went to Brandon, Elk Lake, and St. Michael's, and my grandfather hid from Indian agents. I'm also the MLA for Vancouver Mount Pleasant and the Minister for Tourism, Arts, Culture, and Sport. And our stories are very important. Where we come from and who we are and our DNA is incredibly important. I happen to be responsible for the Royal BC Museum. And my colleague, Minister Rankin, asked me if I could be here today. Without, I cannot not be here today because we are on the edge of moving to a human rights movement that has been long overlooked. The findings of these children, which I will restate. These are Indigenous children that did not return home from school. I don't have to remind people about the painful harms that happened to these children because of colonization, racism, calculated acts of hatred and genocide. But it has shined a light on the truth and bringing light to truth provides a path to healing. The 94 calls to action was the nation speaking about the truth of reconciliation and the calls to government was to step up and do the work. Do the work in partnership as I've said time and time again about paddling together. Learning about the children and the grave sites, the unmarked graves, is part of Articles 71 to 76 of the TRC. And it's important that we start naming the articles. And Canadians and British Columbians understand the work that is needed to move forward. A couple of weeks ago, the province allocated $12 million in funding to support First Nations wanting to investigate former residential <coughs> schools. I would now like to invite my colleague, Minister Rankin, Minister of Indigenous relations and reconciliation. He is going to share more about the next steps in our government's response to support Indigenous peoples, Indigenous nations, and our relatives who didn't make it home. Tuxiasm. Well, thank you very much, Melanie, for a, a very powerful opening to a very important announcement. I acknowledge as well that I'm speaking to you from the tr traditional territories of the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh and Squamish nations. And I want to acknowledge with me, I have Charlene Billow, former chair of the First Nation Health Council. Thanks everyone for joining and for those joining online, thank you as well. I want to acknowledge before beginning, the survivors, the intergenerational survivors and their families who continue to be impacted 
by the legacy of residential schools. Our country is reeling from the recent findings that were uncovered at residential schools, former residential schools, not only in BC but across Canada. The Tecumlux to Shwepmuk people continue to demonstrate enormous leadership and, and strength. They announced their preliminary findings, as Minister Mark announced in, uh, in, in May, and then just a, a week or so ago gave a comprehensive update of that work. There have been further revelations as well in Cranbrook, on Penelicut Island or Cooper Island, and in other provinces of Canada as well. And there are surely more findings that will emerge. Survivors have been sharing their truths, truth for, for years and years. These truths are well documented in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's seminal work. Dr. Sarah Beaulieu conducted research at the former residential school, Camus Residential School site, and she said this, groundbreaking, ground penetrating radar merely provides some spatial specificity to the truth. The truth has been well known for a long while and survivors have told us their story over and over again. These are difficult days, as Minister Mark has emphasized. Survivors, intergenerational survivors and Indigenous peoples across our country are feeling the deep effects of the trauma. We share their grief, their pain and the outrage at the atrocities that we now learn about, or which the TRC documented as well so well. But First Nation communities in British Columbia are meeting this with resilience, leadership and strength. We've been asked as a government to listen, to learn and to act. We're putting communities at the centre and survivors at the centre of our response to this issue as a province. We're taking our direction from their com these communities as we move forward. The province is ready to support the ways forward that First Nations say are ready for their communities, guided by elder, elders and knowledge keepers in those communities. So last month, we announced $12 million for the BC Residential Schools Response Fund. New funding for First Nations is now available to undertake work on former residential schools and former hospitals, the sites near various communities of British Columbia. There are 21 such sites. The communities nearby are called the caretaker communities, and they are the custodians of the missing children. We've said we've moved quickly to provide immediate supports, and that is what the Government of British Columbia is doing. So as of today, caretaker communities can access provincial funding to advance their work at residential schools and hospital sites. We will fast track funding requests so that caretaker communities can plan and do this work at their own pace. This will not be a complicated bureaucratic process. We know this is a difficult time. And we want to make sure that the resources are readily available, easy to access and flexible. As I mentioned, there are 18 former residential school sites in British Columbia and three former hospital sites in British Columbia. Up to $475,000 is available for each of those sites to support caretaker communities in their work. This funding is intended to complement and fill gaps in funding that the federal government may also uh, provide support for. The federal government, of course, is also very much involved in this response. But the funding from British Columbia can be made available for a range of activities. Work related to site searches, planning, technical work, archival research, engaging with elders, knowledge keepers and survivors, engaging with other communities that have an interest in the site. It also includes something that is critically important, supporting the mental health and wellness of survivors and their families. So nations can use this funding to provide mental health and cultural supports, acknowledging how emotionally triggering and distressing this work can be. So we will expedite expressions of interest from caretaker communities across our province. The timing of the grants is fully flexible. Communities can pursue their own path at their own pace. We're also working with Indigenous partners in the province to enhance existing mental health and cultural support services. 
two million dollars of the 12 million dollar fund uh, is targeted to expand culturally safe trauma-informed services and supports crisis lines survivor support networks and the like we know they are seeing big increases in the demand for mental health and wellness and crisis supports at this time so this additional funding will help create extra capacity to help the survivors and intergenerational survivors as they navigate the difficult days ahead. We are determined to do the right thing in our response to the devastation of the residential schools and that devastation that continues to be felt to this day. It's not lost on me that today marks the specific day on which British Columbia entered Confederation 150 years ago. In fact, it's important to use this day as a reminder of the truth of our shared history, of the ongoing harm caused by residential school, of the legacy of colonialism that we need to address head on as a province and heal from. BC can and will do better. One way we can do better is by listening more. The two people we have appointed as First Nation liaisons for this work will help us do just that. They will help us build better relationships between governments and First Nations so that we can remove uh, the obstacles and support and can coordinate the work that needs to be done. So I am here delighted and honoured that Charlene Bellow, past chair of the First Nation Health Council, has agreed to work in this capacity as a liaison officer. And joined with her is someone who could not be here today Lydia Whitsum, who is from the Cowichan Nation and former chief of the Cowichan Nation with First Nations Summit. Charlene and Lydia are well known and widely respected for their leadership and advocacy. Their experience and knowledge are key to effective response that is community led, informed by survivors, and focused upon healing. They will assist caretaker communities in a number of ways, helping them navigate through the federal and provincial partners programs to access resources that are needed, to help facilitate communications between provincial partners and caretaker communities, and provide advice to the province as we move forward together. I cannot think of more qualified or suitable people for this vital liaison role, supporting First Nations as they navigate this difficult work we know this is a challenging undertaking, and we are so very grateful to you that you've agreed to support this work. I thank you so much for stepping up and helping us in this regard. So by way of conclusion, this province will continue to put communities and survivors at the centre of our response. We will work in a coordinated way so communities can have access to the resources they require to do the work that is needed to be done and successfully done. Indigenous communities throughout the province have suffered the loss of children, of their children, to residential schools. This loss is felt by all British Columbians, and this burden should not be borne by the caretaker communities alone. We will continue to work closely with these communities to make sure they are supported as they carry out this complex and sensitive work, and to honour the children through all means available. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Minister Rankin, for uh, this important announcement. And um, to really underscore and emphasize the, the principles of self-determination and to let the nations guide that work. And um, when you mentioned Charlene, uh, you know, to have someone um, with such a tremendous depth of knowledge and leadership. Um, it is my honour to, to say a few words about Charlene, who will be one of the liaisons. Uh, she comes from the Isketum First Nation. She's the former chief, which is why I was a bit shaky. I, no, I normally am used to calling her chief. She has served uh, in senior leadership and advocacy roles at the local, provincial and national levels. She is a strong advocate for the health and well-being of Indigenous children as the former chair of the First Nations Health Council. She's an advocate 
and supporter of residential school survivors and their families. She's a leader in the community to end violence against Indigenous women. We are fortunate to have her supporting this work. She is my friend, she is a matriarch, and she's going to help lift up the nations right now who need all the love that we can give the communities because I know as an Indigenous person that we are holding on to one another like never before. With that, Charlene, please join me at the podium and say a few words. Thank you. Wait, go quiet up. Spew a is a good thing. Charlene Bellew and Squicks. Eagle Star Woman is my name. I'm from Eskerim, from Alkali Lake. I want to thank the Musqueam, Squamish, and Swewatooth for allowing us to do this important work today. I attended St. Joseph's Mission Indian Residential School in Williams Lake. We've waited for this day for a long time. My own great-grandfather committed suicide at St. Joseph's Mission Residential School. They buried him there without telling our family. This was during a period of time when flogging was at its worst. They strung our children on poles and lashed them until they passed out. I look forward to finding my great-grandfather so that we can have closure. Another one of our children, Duncan Sticks, eight years old, ran away from the residential school and froze to death. There was an inquest held into his death with no results and no change for the residential school for years. Any of these stories that I'm telling you come from my own experience or having had the opportunity to research and understand what's happened to my great-great-grandfather and to our children so that we can do something and make sure that our children don't ever go through this experience again. I've had the privilege and honor to work with Indian residential school families and communities for the past 30 years, regionally, provincially, and nationally. I've been there with former students in criminal investigations, going to court, <coughs> holding Bishop O'Connor accountable, bringing home children that priests fathered, brought them home to their loved ones. I've been engaged with the TRC. I've been engaged in our own inquiry on residential schools, engaged with an RCMP task force in 2005, where we wanted to make sure that our children had a voice in how they would proceed with resolving their own residential school experience. So we've waited for this time for a long time. Through all of those inquiries, we told governments, we told churches, our children never came home. They never believed us. Now we know, now you know. And we have the responsibility to work together to bring our loved ones home. I honor the leaders 
and the health leads from the Kamloops, St. Eugene's in Tunaka, and Penelicut for their courage and strength to the former students and their families through the discovery of remains that have happened within their respective nations. There are 18 residential schools that operated within the province. Each one of you will have a unique approach to how you plan to investigate the residential school in your nation and how you will proceed with healing within your communities and we will be there for you. To our chiefs, our leaders, to the public, our strength comes from knowing that our ancestors prepared us for this time. We've had visions come to our traditional leaders who our ancestors spoke and prepared us for this time. Our ancestors saw that we would go through this great dark period of residential schools, sexual abuse, violence, 60 scoop, day schools, And they gave us songs and they gave us ceremonies to be able to hit those kind of crises and trauma head on and be able to hold one another up. It's great that what was meant to be destroyed in residential schools, our language, our culture, our traditions, will now be our greatest strength. I encourage our leaders and our families to continue songs, our sacred fires when it's safe to do so, so that we can continue to honor those children that never came home and that we will wait to bring home. We look forward to that time. To the citizens in BC that are listening, I encourage you to continue to stand with our former students at all of these Indian residential school events or go to a residential school close by. Take time to walk with our people. Take time to ride horses with our people. Take time to listen stand by the water together, cleanse, pray, and hold one another up. It's important that we do this work together. Having the opportunity to work with the government at this time, I commit to the former students that I will continuously hold governments and churches accountable for what's happened to our children. The resources that are identified need to be out to our communities quickly so that our leadership can continue with the investigations that are planned throughout the province. And all of that to be led in a culturally appropriate environment with our former students and their families advising our leadership. I look forward to the work that we need to do together and I'm grateful for Melanie and the work that she does for the government so that we have a voice at the table. I want to acknowledge all of our matriarchs throughout the province. It's our children that we lost to the residential school. It's our children that were lost to the 60s scoop. It's our children that are lost to the child welfare system. We need to make sure that the work that we do, that we hold up our matriarchs and strengthen our families through the leadership of our women throughout the province and throughout the organizations and governments. I encourage you to do more to help our women and our families. 
And again, I just want to say and I look forward to being of service to the former students, to the families, to our nations, and to the communities. Can I give you a hug? Dr. Bunny Henry, I'm hugging. <laughs> uh, just want to thank Charlene for uh, your medicine, your words, your leadership, your fortitude your unwavering love, and we're so honored that you have stepped up to, to hold up um, the communities. And, and what we share in common is we don't sign up for politics for the sake of politics. We sign up to make change. So thank you. Um, not joining us today, but also another fierce warrior is Lydia Sweetsome. Um, she can't be here today. But I can tell you that she served four terms as the elected chief of the Cowichan tribes, played a pivotal role in the creation of the First Nations Health Authority. Throughout her career, she has advocated for Indigenous and human rights locally, nationally, and internationally. Ms. Sweetsum has more than 20 years of experience in leadership and advocacy positions. She is currently an elected representative on the political executive of the First Nations Summit. We're also very grateful to have her skills wisdom supporting this work right now. I want to offer my thanks to Charlene and Lydia um, to know that you're going to hold up our nations and that you're going to hold us accountable. Um, I can assure you that our government is not running away from these conversations, no matter how painful they are. Caretaker communities are carrying the weight of this work and I know they will welcome your support. When Charlene said, walk with them, paddle with them, march with them, stand up, fight with them, that is the invitation we have for British Columbians and Canadians right now. And when she talked about the matriarchs and our children, that is why we fight. With the trauma of recent residential school findings, and the health and well-being of survivors, their mental, emotional, and cultural supports for, five, for survivors is available right now. It's critically important. I know that as the MLA people have reached out, they are holding on to one another like never before. But we need you to keep holding on. You can call 1-866-925-4419 and um, just know that there is help and there will be more help coming to the nations. Tuxias, I'm, I'm handing it over now to Minister Rankin. Thank you. Please press star one to enter the queue. You will be limited to one question and one follow-up. Please also remember to take your phone off mute. You will not be audible until your name is called. Our first question today is from Lisa Cordasco, Vancouver Sun. Please go ahead. Thank you. Um, Minister, this is not to downplay the importance of the healing aspect, but how will your government address the justice aspect of this situation? Because I believe the chief of the Tacom Lips has called for a special prosecutor and wants to have that aspect taken more seriously. The Residential School History and Dialogue Center has written a paper about such a legal framework, and the UBCIC has called or has passed a resolution on this. So what is your government doing to address the justice aspects? Well, thank you, Lisa. Today's announcement, of course, has been about the response, the two, nation, uh, the two aspects of the initial response from the province, uh, namely support for the communities, uh, the 21 that I mentioned, both residential school and hospital sites, as well as the 
mental health and cultural supports. As nations come forward with other demands, and uh, we, we are open to dialogue on those various topics. I know that there have been conversations on those justice issues with the Attorney General, with Minister Lametti at the federal level as well, and we stand ready to engage in those conversations uh, in the next while as, they, as those uh, requests come forward. Lisa, did you have a follow-up? Yes, I'd like to know what initiatives your government is taking in pursuing that. The focus by government has been specifically to focus on healing, and not much focus has been given on justice. And I'm wondering what you are actually doing to advance that framework. Well, there have been requests made, uh, at least you've mentioned from the Takamloops, and we've heard from other nations uh, and other leaders that there be uh, attention given to the justice response. Uh, what form that should take is complicated by the federal-provincial divide, of course, but for example, there could be investigations. One, one has suggested uh, that we have criminal investigations. Others have suggested uh, a commission of inquiry. There have been suggestions that we simply allow the RCMP to do their work in collaboration with Crown Council. There is a role for the federal government that has been sought. All of these require consideration and a careful, uh, a careful uh, consideration by both levels of government and discussions, as I say, with the Leadership Council and individual nations. And that is the, that is the kind of uh, discussion that is taking place uh, right now. Our next question is from Nantu Sumahoro, CBC Radio Canada. Hello, hi. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Yes, hi. Uh, the question is for Minister Murray, and I want an answer in French, if possible. Uh, so I want to know um, how and when the sound will be. Um, available, so I'm, I understand that it's today, but how long would it take for the First Nation to have the defense? Merci. Alors, en français, il y aura un fonds qui est établi il y a quelques, quelques jours, et dans les, dans les jours qui viennent, ce sera possible. On aura un site web pour les, les peuples autochtones et les collectivités qui, qui veulent accéder à, cette, à ce site web. Uh, alors, ça, ça va... Ça va se dérouler uh, immédiatement, je veux dire. Donc, uh, je suis certain qu'avec le site web et avec uh, les, les autres, uh, le, le, la conversation avec le gouvernement provincial, ce sera facile, efficace et immédiat. Did you have a follow-up? Uh, yes. Et est-ce que uh, vous pensez que la somme de 12 millions est suffisante pour effectuer des fouilles sur tous les sites des pensionnats et aussi aider les membres des, des communautés? Non, ce n'est pas suffisant, mais on a le partenariat avec le gouvernement fédéral, bien sûr, et uh, ils ont la responsabilité principale en ce domaine, mais c'est pour aider le gouvernement fédéral, pour être une collectivité entre les deux gouvernements et les, et les partenaires autochtones aussi. Alors, c'est ça ce qui est important. On va, faire, on va former une équipe pour s'adresser à ce problème, à ce défi énorme. Our next question is from Jeremy Hainsworth, Glacier Media. Please go ahead. Hi, Minister. I'm uh, wondering how you arrived at the figure of 545,000 per, uh, per site. I've spoken with uh, some of the leadership from Williams Lake. And they're saying that ground penetrating radar alone is about a dollar a square meter. If you add to that, uh, you know, excavations, exhumations, taking of DNA, uh, doing archival research, et cetera, et cetera, those dollars really start to add up. So I'm, I'm wondering, uh, you know, I, I spoke to Stuart Phillip and he said this is nowhere near enough. Uh, right. You arrive at that number. Right. I've spoken with Chief, Chief Sellers of Williams Lake, uh, Cook P. Sellers, as well today on that very subject. Um, look, $475,000 for each of the 18 uh, schools plus the three sites is, as you say, not going to be sufficient, we expect, but we understand that this is to fill in the gaps that may exist with the programming the federal government and the funding the federal government has offered. As you know, in the 2019 last federal budget, there was $27 million that were earmarked for this purpose, and it's not going to last very long across the country, as we well understand. So I'm confident that with the two governments in dialogue with each other, we will, we will do what is required to do this important uh, work. But the province is here to do immediate 
uh, filling in the gaps response as people step up. And they'll step up in their own way in their own time, as I emphasized in my remarks. Some nations are, have come forward already uh, with requests for funding. The, uh, the, the Williams Lake is an example. The Takamloops, of course, to Shrepmik have also done so. Others are moving more slowly according to their pace and their cultural protocols and, and aspirations. So we need, to, uh, we need to move with them. The point of our funding is that it'll be available for each and every one of those 21, if you will, those 18 residential school caretaker communities plus the three hospitals I spoke of. So at minimum, there will be that sum available. And uh, if they don't come forward for a few days or months or year, even years to come, it will be there for them. Did you have a follow-up? No, I'm good. That's all the questions we have for today. Thank you for everyone for joining us.